Good I took a nap right because I just sometimes just doze off because it's it's all right. Well, last week would have been on the zoo, so I'm sorry for delaying. But. Okay. I'm here with Aviva Kempner, Washington, D.C. filmmaker, in her home in Washington, and the date today is February the 13th, 2011. So thank you, Aviva. Um, I want to start with the, the, your birth. You were born in Berlin. So right. talk about the, the circumstances of that and your, your parents' background. Right. Uh, I am technically the first American war baby born in Berlin. I am not the first Jewish child born in Berlin, but I'm pretty sure I'm the first American. And the reason I'm an American is my dad was in the U.S. military with the military government. He was originally from Lithuania, had come here as an immigrant, had fought... Do you know, do you know the, excuse me, the year that he came? Um, in the 20s. Uh, he was uh, born in Ponyevich and came to America from Kovna. So he came here, and once he got his citizenship, he enlisted in World War II, the U.S. Army, and went to the Pacific. He said he enlisted to fight the Nazis, and they sent him to the Pacific. He wrote uh, journalistic articles in the military, including a column, How to Write Yiddish to Your Bubby. I have a copy of that, or I had a copy of it. In any event, um, and after World War II ended, because he spoke Yiddish and Hebrew and Lithuanian and Russian, they sent him to work with the military government in, in Berlin. He got there, he must have gotten there in 45, well, you know, after. Um, while he was there, he continued to write journalistic articles. He was the features editor for, I think, U.S. Observer or Stars and Stripes, one of those. And he covered a story about a brother and a sister being reunited in Berlin. And that was my mother and my uncle. My mother, whose maiden name is Helen, uh, or Hanka Cheshla, um, was in Berlin because she, being blonde and green-eyed, had passed with two other girls as a Polish Catholic in uh, Germany. They got false papers and went from Sosnowicz to Germany near Stuttgart and worked in a labor camp as Polish workers. How old was she during this time? Oh, in her teens. Mm -hmm. And she um, was liberated by Americans, thank God, because I recently saw a movie about how the Russians treated the women right after the liberation of Germany. And she was taken by an army tank to Berlin where she worked as a translator uh, from, I think, UNRWA, United Nations, whatever it is, and, um, and looked for relatives. Unfortunately, her parents and sister died in Auschwitz, and only her brother survived, and that was the story my dad wrote about the brother and sister being re reunited. And uh, the dashing soldier met the Holocaust survivor, and they married, and we lived in Berlin. I believe for about a year and a half, and then we moved to Munich where my dad worked with, he resigned and worked for, um, uh, God, I'll remember it in a minute, um, it's not highest, it's the, the joint distribution. Did your parents speak about their wartime experiences, your mother especially, well, when my, you were growing up? Uh, uh, by the way, my father's mother was also murdered by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we moved to Detroit, I think when I was around three and a half, we came to Detroit around 1950. Um, I grew up in a home where, especially during the Jewish holidays, my mother was very upset, but she did not talk about the experiences. She hid them from us, per se. Excuse me, when you say she was very upset? During, she, on the Jewish the holidays, holiday Jewish holidays, you know, she was missing her family. Uh -huh. Uh, I had no grandparents on either side. My grandfather on my dad's side had died of cancer when he was young. So it was just a matter of um, sort of knowing you're a child of a Holocaust survivor without knowing any details. So matter of fact, we protected her from watching any movies, but I was totally obsessed, especially with the issue of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, I must have re- Oh, I actually, I realized the first time um, I found out really about the Holocaust was reading Exodus when I was 13, vacationing in Northport at my cousin's uh, summer home. 
and I can remember reading the stories about Dove and Karen, and it was like a great revelation. It's sort of interesting because years later, you hear about Russian Jewry learning about being Jewish, reading Exodus by Leon Uris, and I totally identified with that aspect of their experience. So you you chose to um, identify with the, with the not, excuse me, not identify, but the story of the resistance was what spoke to you out of that. Experience. Well, uh, Exodus was a much broader uh -huh. thing. Um, then I also um, went to Israel when I was 16 and was exposed to, you know, things like Yad Vashem or the relatives that had survived. I heard a little bit more about my mother's family. That was her, basically her relatives. But I was also seeing my dad's relatives. He has a uh, sister that went in the um, in the 20s to Israel. But I think for me, it was this fascination when I was in high school to read anything I could of more popular culture. Again, Leon Uris, mm -hmm. Mila 18, I kept on rereading that. I remember in high school, we had a book, a high school English that I talked about called The Wall by John Hershey, which is a much better version, a fictionalized version of what was happening during the war. And I was watching, I was talking about it in, and I remember the teacher saying, what was the dramatic moment in the book? And I raised my hand. I said, well, when they realize they're all going to end up in Treblinka. But at that point, I really hadn't made that connection that had happened with my grandparents. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of literature of, or information even available for someone, a young, curious Well, there person. weren't Holocaust museums. Uh -huh. There weren't classes on it. We were just reading. I mean, it's not a coincidence that it was more fiction literature. You know, between Exodus and the Wall, mm -hmm. they had exposed me to the Holocaust. But um, I also remember really clearly, you know, my mother would speak to my uncle in Polish, so I knew they were Polish, you know, European. And um, she would cry a lot. I mean, there were always pictures of her mother and her father that she would pray to. So you knew about the losses, and they were especially heightened on the holidays. Um, my parents were divorced when I was 13, so I sort of heard more about it from my dad mm -hmm. telling me what he knew. Um, but I remember a profound thing that happened to me in college. I was at the University of Michigan, and we'd have to check what year this was. But a uh, pawnbroker had been an incredible film to me because it was really about how a survivor lives with his life, you know, years later. And uh, Rod Steiger was up for an Oscar versus... Um, Lee Marvin and Cat Ballou. And I remember when Lee Marvin got it and Rod Steiger didn't. And I, w I was crying in my college dorm. I was absolutely devastated because I felt like sort of maybe we could say my side, you know, what I identified with wasn't getting it. Plus, he was totally brilliant in that movie. Do, do you think that, that uh, I mean, the, the, the typical, if there is one, story of uh, second generation mm -hmm. Holocaust survivors' uh, children, uh, it adds a, a certain seriousness or weightiness to one's life. Hmm. Do, do you feel that in your own life? Well, I think several things happen. I think in a lot of survivors' families, you either hear so much ad nauseum, sort of the mouse story. Mm -hmm. um, I think my friend Mindy heard a lot. Mm -hmm. Or else there's this need to protect and not talk about. Mm -hmm. So I think I had more of the latter. So in some ways it might have been, I don't know if the word's easier, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, the combination of me being an immigrant and coming here and having people make fun of my English when I first came to Detroit, you know, and then I was also a child of divorced parents, so mm -hmm. that was another, no one was getting divorced back mm -hmm. then. And then, you know, sort of survivor's family, it's sort of sort of three things that sort of put me apart. Um, and I always felt, even though I didn't have the languages, you know, more European. Of course, my brother was born in the States, so maybe he didn't have that. So um, even though you came to the United States just as a little girl, yeah, you still felt that, like you were living the immigrant experience. And that's, it's more a psychological immigrant experience, you know. I'm still not good on pronouncing a lot, in some words, so it's still maybe a leftover. But I still identify with anyone who's an immigrant, you know, people who work for me. I always ask people, where are you from? Mm -hmm. You know, this, being an immigrant is part of my story, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So and I remember there was someone in my class at school, high school, I often think about her, a French girl, and she had an accent. Now, she had come much later. 
she had come when we were in high school, and I always wondered what happened to her, and and I always feel a little guilty I wasn't nicer to her. Is that funny? And your parents must have felt like well, did did your parents feel like immigrants in in the well, sense? Well, um, I didn't hear their accents, uh -huh. but apparently my my mother definitely had an accent. But it's funny. But I I hear my uncle's accent, and my dad was also you know European. Um, you know, he, he used Yiddish a lot. And when, when they were still married, they would speak Yiddish so we wouldn't understand. So, you know, it's just foreign languages was something in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was very funny in terms of when she served food, when it was a certain group of people, she would call it gehak de lever. With others, it was pate mm -hmm. or crepe suzettes or blintzes. You know, there was always this sort of what you present to people who are... And, and, uh, I think another interesting thing is my mother, and she married a year after my parents divorced, a professor, but amongst their best friends were other Holocaust survivors, intellectuals, psychiatrists. It just happened to be a propensity of shrinks, maybe because Sturba was in Detroit. So I always heard a lot of Polish being spoken mm -hmm. and people debating, you know, sort of intellectual issues. So uh, there's just something about the atmosphere. Also, my mother, I'm a big collector of art, but I got that from my mother. Then she started painting. She, your mother was an artist. When my brother and I went off to school, she started painting, but she was always just decorating very nicely. So I, I, I think there was always a sense of my parents are European, and um, I think there was also very much, and then I brought up, was up, brought up by my father who worked with the poverty program, that if, you know, the Jews have suffered the most, you know, the, the thought of losses during the Holocaust, but then the blacks and the Armenians, there's also an, always an affinity with Armenians and also African Americans and sort of, I, I'm a little young to have been in the civil rights movement, but growing up in Detroit, I always went, lived in integrated neighborhoods and integra went to integrated high schools. So I always, I think especially in college, you know, reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, identifying a lot with black struggles. So you're, you're and, yeah. And the anti-war movement. Uh -huh. So your, your childhood, you were really exposed to a lot of um, kind of the, 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 the quilt of America. Um, okay. Yeah. So you're you're uh, thinking that your your whole childhood kind of reflected this patchwork of Jewish of uh, American life with the melting pot, uh, writ, writ small in in Detroit. Right. All the different things you were ex exposed Well, you to. know, it was sort of a mixed bag because on one hand, I went to an all city high school called Cast Tech, which really influenced me. It was a school that developed a science and arts program in response to the Sputnik, which is sort of interesting because they, they were bringing this up about, you know, being ahead in science. So it was very intellectually, you know, I, I, I grew up in a sort of, in a Jewish neighborhood, and I should have gone to the more local school, which was Mumford, which was the Jewish school. But my parents decided to send me to travel every day to go to this all-city special program. And I think in that I was exposed to a lot more people, you know, diversity, if whatever, that's the word today, but, um, and it's where, you know, I read books like The Wall, but it also, um, I guess I, I'm trying to think what also in high school is, I got involved in democratic politics, um, but then, maybe I'm jumping the gun, how, and, yeah. yeah. How, how was your, what part of your identity was, was Jewish? What part of my, well, when it says race, I always want to check uh, Jewish. It's very strong identity, especially through my father, who, um, you know, who's a Jew? My dad, you know, as I call it, the bubby alert, uh, developed that game, but also felt that that was a strong affinity you have with other minorities. That was part of being Jewish, mm -hmm. is justice. The high holidays, I did not go to, I went to Sunday school one year and it just didn't work. And because my parents were divorced, there was, my mother never was an instant, you know, she prayed all the time, especially to her parents. But going to services was not her big thing, as, as, long, as well as my stepfather. But it was all about being very proud, ethnically Jewish, and it was about being intellectual and political. I think, you know, mm -hmm. the pursuit of knowledge mm -hmm. and the pursuit of justice, I think, are the biggest 
definitions for me being Jewish. Is that still true today? Uh, yeah. You know, in college, I got very involved in the college newspaper. I got very involved in covering the anti-war movement and, and through that being part of it. Um, I went off and worked on RFK's national campaign. And what's interesting about working for RFK, it was my first funeral because I never had any grandparents. So, and I could never work on national politics for years after that. But it was all about politics changing the world. And then it was an undergrad in psychology and then I got a master's in urban planning when I didn't get into law school. And again, it was, you know, to change the cities. And going to New Mexico was a profound experience. New Mexico? I went to Vista in New Mexico. This is after college? Right. So instead of going to, it's sort of my Peace Corps experience. So people kept on thinking I was in Mexico. But anyhow, it was the first time I was away from Michigan, because I had gone to the University of Michigan. I also got exposed very much to um, Native American affairs and issues, as well as Chicano. And it was the height of the Native American movement. As a matter of fact, I've just co-written a script about an activist I knew at that time who was killed in a shootout for unfortunately taking justice in his own hands. But um, what I realized is that urban planning wasn't getting the results I wanted to do to change the world. So that's why I came to Washington in 76 to go to law school. And so you, you spent your three years... Oh, excuse me, 73. All right. So you spent your time in law school. But you yeah, I was two years in Vista, so. but did very... Well, that's not entirely true. In Vista, I did a lot of work community organizing with model cities mm -hmm. and trying to change what was happening on the Indian reservations and the, Chica uh, and the Chicano neighborhoods. So it was all activism. I mean, that's sort of my college years, mm -hmm. my, um, my post-urban planning years. And then I came here to go to Antioch School of Law, which was billed as... So in se September 73, I, I got into Antioch College Law, which was an activist mm -hmm. law school. And I had considered being there in New Mexico to go to Chile, because I was very interested in this whole thing about a, s a successful socialist democracy. So I got into law school and I came here, and that September 73 is when the coup happened. Mm -hmm. So then I got very involved in human rights issues. That's my human rights years when I was going to Antioch, which was a very good time because I, there was an immigration clinic. I could help try to get people parole visas. Um, I went to a lot of demonstrations. I got to know a lot of Latin Americans, either from the Chile-Argentina movement, the El Salvador movement. I was very involved in the early human rights Latin American groups. And I think what was happening always with me, that if it wasn't one cause, it was another that I saw as you know, a liberal Jewish person to get involved in. It's a, it's a, to me, it looks like a, a tikkun olam, repairing the world kind of Absolutely. theory. So do you, do you, is it a conscious Jewish thing? Or right, because it's all back from my father mm -hmm. saying, you know, that we, we can't just be for ourselves, we got to be for others, we suffer, you know. Uh, I think for me, the Pinochet regime was like Nazis mm -hmm. because of the kind of repression they did and killing people and also the Argentinian generals. And, you know, maybe Germans being hidden down there. It was totally, this feeling is, I would have tried to do something in World War II. Let me do it now. Mm -hmm. um, so I got very involved in the Latin American movement. I knew Orlando Letelier very well. The ambassador was murdered. And that was, you know, um, it was doing a lot of work around that time. And to this day, some of my closest friends are from that period. Do you remember the, you must remember the, the, the uh, day when he was killed? Oh, yeah, I was right, I lived right by that circle. Mm -hmm. And I was very involved in planning the funeral. And I'm still very good friends with the sons, or two of the ones that once live in L.A., I mm -hmm. always see. Mm -hmm. And with Isabel whenever she comes here. Um, so how did you end up becoming a filmmaker with this Well, this, this gets to, so then I was running an immigration clinic. I graduated from law school and I started working for an immigration law firm which goes to this thing about immigrants. This is something that is a total, to this day, people working at my house now, a guy from Albania, the Guatemalans, you know, everyone, you know, I'm always asked, where are you from? What's the experience? And I think it's, again, this personal identification as well as I find people from different parts of the world fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, I'm working as an immigration lawyer. I also had spent a summer doing Native American law, so it was sort of both things. And my, in September, excuse me, in the summer of 76, my dad was supposed to come to uh, my and my brother's law school graduations and suddenly came down with leukemia. And he died the morning of the afternoon we got there. Now, I should mention that in 73, my dad made Aliyah to Israel. Mm -hmm. And I had visited them every year, and you know, so there was a, always a strong Zionist push in my family. This is it. in his retirement years. He chose exactly. to make Aliyah. Yeah. Did he talk about that decision? Uh, well, it was always he wanted after World War II and from Europe, he wanted to go to um, Israel. But my mother, her brother, had already gone to the states, and she was a little nervous about war, still war. But he always wanted to go to Israel, so he was fulfilling a dream, and he spoke Hebrew fluently. By that time, I mean, almost every year we had gone to visit Israel, you know, so I grew up, unfortunately not with the language, but always the big push about Israel. Mm -hmm. So my father died, I came back. He died back in Israel? Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we buried my dad, and you know, at age 30, for me, I lost my father who in some ways had instilled with me the most Jewish pride. So I don't think that's a coincidence. Well, explain that. Well, it was just always about proud about being Jewish, but it means you should be empathetic for others. Mm -hmm. And to a point of being chauvinistic, you know, you know who's Jewish and, you know, it's just, there's one of these. Do you believe that there's a, such a thing as a Jewish soul? Jewish soul, yeah. It sounds like well, maybe you think your father yeah. Well, my mother, did, I mean, between my three parents, to me, being Jewish is being intellectual and political and care for the world mm -hmm. and have an artistic eye, mm -hmm. you know. The, spiritual? Uh, I have to say my mother was the most spiritual, neither of my father's. I'm, I'll explain to you after I finish Partisans what I did later, but spiritual is less a factor in being Jewish for me. So... I came back that summer and studied for the bar, and my heart wasn't in it, and I did not pass. Mm -hmm. But I started working for the immigration law firm, and then I went and studied it again, and I did not pass. Uh, I liked doing immigration law, although it was interesting, the first day I was given something, it was to represent the Moonies, and I told them I couldn't do it. <laughs> so again, this political thing. Uh, so when I could no longer, I couldn't practice immigration law because I didn't pass the bar, I started doing a lot of Native American rights research and working in that world. Um, and then I worked for the uh, National Tribal Chairman's Association. Um, and then there was another association of Native Americans that I worked on different issues. Uh, and I was still trying to find myself because it was pretty devastating that I hadn't passed the bar. And then I started doing a little business law, and then I went home, 79, to Detroit. I mean, I was living here, I was continuing to live here, and I decided um, to go home for Thanksgiving, and I picked up a book that my mother and stepfather had gotten because they had hosted this writer, Lucian Dobroshinsky, and it's called uh, um, Image Before My Eyes. And it was uh, a book of, photo essay book on Polish Jewry between the wars. And I went bananas over it. Because I started looking at it and I was just thinking, this is how our relatives were, this and that. And I went home, so Thanksgiving is pretty, you know, that next month. And I decided, I reread Miller 18. And I decided at that point, now I have to back up, I had worked um, doing a lot of events for human rights issues, including film events. And a lot of my friends were filmmakers. You, know. you mean organizing events? For yeah, them? yeah. So, it's sort of my first producing. So I went home, and by then I had also worked with the Iranian student movement, and I went home and I decided that I'm going to make a film about Jews fighting Nazis. Did, did you know anything about making a film? Uh, only what I saw my friends uh -huh. do. And I had raised some money for one film on the Shah, or the downfall of the Shah. So I went just out of the blue. I mean, not. But it's just well, like, yes and no. I mean, this is my rap in life. Sounds a little impulsive. Uh, I always said Elijah okay. uh, hit me with a. Um, well, 
I think it was, um, I think uh, another two things that happened at that time. I had seen um, Roots on TV and it was totally, totally engaged with Roots and feeling, you know, and read about the whole Roots thing. And I also had seen Holocaust on TV, you know, the five episodes. And I think those two miniseries had a profound effect on me. That, you know, now it's time to do my roots. Mm -hmm. And that's what the book and those two things. You know, this is actually a speech I sometimes give about what got me going on my filmmaking. I also had the uncle that survived Auschwitz that was very wealthy. They gave me the initial money. I went to him and I said, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll, I'll support mm -hmm. it. Now, this is the beshared things that happened. It was image before my eyes, the book that got me going, right? So I started asking friends. I'm very good friends uh, with Susanna Styron. William Styron's daughter, and he said, well, you know, this filmmaker, Josh Woletsky, just finished a film called Image Before My Eyes. So it's the film based on the book. And then I have good friends with Barbara Koppel, even to this day I had met in Cuba, and she had used Josh as a sign editor. So I contacted Josh, and I met with him, and I said, would you make this film with me? So I decided I'm going to be a producer. I'm going to make a film about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And Josh agreed, because I said, listen, we've got to make a film about, how, you know, this youth that you make. You know, the premise of the image before my eyes is there was um, a very high culture Jewish community between the wars, mostly in the city, so it wasn't shtetl life. Mm -hmm. You know, it was political. In Poland. Was in Poland. Mm -hmm. So um, he agreed, and then we started researching. And it turns out that, that summer I went again to Israel and I went to the head of Yad Vashem and I'm talking to Itzhak Arad and he hands me his book called Ghetto and Flames and says, this is what you should make a film about because the first call of resistance came out of Vilna. So I emailed, I wrote, no email then, I wrote Josh and I said, you know, I don't think it should be Warsaw anymore because a lot of these survivors are alive. And I went and saw Abba Kovner and his wife, Vitka Kempner, and Heike Grossman, and Rishka Korczak, and... Who were all living at the time. That was the big and, thing. And you're related in, in some way. No, it's a total him? coincidence. No. Well, my no, last name is really same. Poe Kempner. Okay. So my dad dropped the Poe, so it's okay. a total coincidence. Okay. So then... Um, and how, how did they respond to, to, to you? Uh, they were really interested because no one had come to them. I mean, the, you know, it's ironic because, uh, what's his name, writes an article, um, the guy who did Defiant Swick last year or the year before and says, I decided there was never a movie on Jewish resistance that's got to be done. And I'm thinking, the year the article came out, 30 years ago, I decided, mm -hmm. you know. And I think it has to do with this total fantasy of fighting Nazis, that I had been doing it for years through my political work fighting fascists who took over in countries, and that the time was to come home now. So it was seeing that image before my eyes, not having an unresolved career, and I decided, but I had always grown up watching films, loving films, and, um, you know, I learned from working with Josh. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you had a this is a pretty strong motivator to tell this story. Yeah, yeah. And personal and... Um, right. And the great story about the Vilna Ghetto, it wasn't about who fought what gun, you know, how many shots, but it was really the moral dilemmas of fighting the Nazis. And, you know, originally I thought the question was, why didn't Jews fight back? Which is, you know, a lot of survivors or children of survivors ask themselves, and I think really the question is, how could they? We didn't have a nation, we didn't have a standing army, and... I think more than anything, that's what Partisans of Vilna does. And the film was finished 25 years ago this September. I'm trying to get some action on having it come out a lot. When, when you talk about the moral dilemmas of fighting the Nazis, explain yeah. what you mean by that. Well, it was everything from, you know, you could get your fellow Jew in trouble. You could get your family member in trouble. If you're, you know, it was mostly political youth that were those who were involved in trying to um, get Jews to fight. So it's it's all about, um, and you know, the profound thing I read one day was Itzhak Zuckerman, who was part of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, who survived the war and years later with his wife Ziva, Ziva Lubekin, I think it is, started Le Meher Gettio, Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, 
said that um, when he was, uh, he said at a resistance conference, I was on the kibbutz with my child and I realized that if I had been married with the child, I wouldn't have joined the resistance. It was... Would not have. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's, you know, there was such family orientation in uh -huh. Jewish homes that oftentimes you wouldn't sacrifice being with your family. And it's not a coincidence, it's mostly Jewish youth. Mm -hmm. So I um, put together a major proposal and NEH funded it. Talk about beginning luck. Well, Josh Walewski already had gotten money for uh, Image Before My Eyes. So there's a track record. And quite frankly, no one had done it. And we got the the major consultants, you know. So, so that, I think Ellie yeah. Wiesel was one of the readers on that proposal. But anyhow. Okay, so now from, from then, now you, you've said that your mission in life is to make films about... about, about underknown Jewish heroes. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting because my friend asked me last night if I could have made the film we saw, Bitiful, about the underclass in Barcelona. This one with Javier Bedel. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I, 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 for me, and I always say this once I've been able to articulate it, that my family as well as my people have been so devastated by war and fascism that I need to make the stories that are uplifting, mm -hmm. you know, or to tell the stories of our heroes mm -hmm. so the next generations can have those along as well as the devastation, mm -hmm. you know. Now, have, have you shown partisans in Vilna in Eastern Europe? Yeah, uh, in 1990 there was the Jewish Film Festival in Moscow and then I took the film to Vilna and I took the film to Kovno. That's why I was telling my brother just now, and you know, he should go. What was the response? It was very positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any Jews remaining? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, which just reminds me, I just thought of someone. i got to remember who told me. i got to hold a single list. Do you, do you see yourself as a, um, um, a mentor for other young filmmakers? Uh, yeah, but before I get okay. to that, let me tell you how each film came about. Okay. So while I'm making Partisans of Vilna, this underlying question for me is, why didn't American Jews help more? I remember one thing my mother said after the war, no one asked her what happened to her. You know, there's a little, I think, a complex of people who came here afterwards, you know, and... You know, you mean, mean when you say no one asked her about well, her experiences? I think they were her two friends of, or, yeah, or her yeah. community. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh -huh. this is—I don't think it's a coincidence that among her closest friends were other Holocaust uh -huh. survivors, because uh -huh. it was something, even without talking about it, that they understood each other's stories, uh, and they made new family members out of that. So that was sort of an underlying thing. And I remember one of my college um, friends talking to her father while I was making Partisans of Vilna, who's a real lefty, who said to me, you know, we were worried about anti-Semitism here. So I'm in L.A. opening up Partisans of Vilna, and I heard that Hank Greenberg died. And that was the great revelation. That was going to be next. That was going to be the American Jewish experience. Now you have to understand that every Yom Kippur, my dad would talk. Oh, uh, oh God, I have to remember to tell you something else. Every Yom Kippur, my father would talk about Hank Greenberg when we were growing up in Detroit and how he didn't play in Yom Kippur. That I always thought he was part of Kol Nidre. So, you know, it was a way... But you always thought he was, he was part, part of Kol, Kol Nidre. Because that's uh -huh. going to services. <laughs> but I also think that the first film, in a way, was for my mother, even though she wasn't so much in the resistance, although passing as a Polish Catholic in Germany, as far as I'm concerned. She was alive when the film... Oh yeah, my mother just died three years ago. Yeah. My dad never saw any of my films. Uh -huh. That must be a big regret. It's a big regret, but he's the inspiration. Right. So my mother, passing as a Polish Catholic, to me was resistant. Uh -huh. So she's, in a way, one of my heroines. How did she respond to your, to your film? When I first decided to make it, she was very negative. She says, what? Those are my stories. I don't want you to deal with it. It's too difficult. Very, very proud of me after. Not so much the struggle. Well, partisans, I didn't struggle as much. Hank took me 13 years. Mm -hmm. But I decided it was, A, my love story to Detroit, unfortunately the first dead city in America. Um, I cannot imagine what it meant to go to work every day and have people yelling at you because you're Jewish. You know, that, that he was a real hero here. And... Uh, Are you saying that he used to go to work every day? Oh, Hank. No, I'm talking about Hank Greenberg. And people... Well, they would yell all these anti-Semitic oh, things. Oh, in this, from the stands. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, and also, I want to counter stereotypes. 
So the first one is the Jews never fought back. That's a stereotype. Uh, and the other is that all Jewish men are nevishes. That's not the Jewish man hero I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Hank Greenberg was this larger-than-life hero, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's not all the Woody Allen nevishy thing. So I wanted to do that, too. Um, and I'm a big fan of Diner, and one of the things in Diner is sort of this fan adulation of their heroes. So to me, I was getting, you know, humor is a big thing. And I think that's what I try. Partisans is a little different, but try to do laughter and tears. That's the Jewish experience. Mm -hmm. What I forgot to say is right after Partisans, I did start going to shul, and I went back for an adult bat mitzvah. Mm -hmm. so In that, Washington. Right, mm -hmm. uh, at Fabrenian with Norman, uh, Norman Shore. So I think that was my one spiritual time. Meaningful? Yeah, no, it was very meaningful. Um, I was totally terrified about speaking Hebrew, but I think it also made me realize that um, ultimately I'm an atheist, you know, because of the Holocaust. I mean, I respect my best friend in the world is very, is conservadox, very observant. Um, actually, Eva Fogelman, who they should be interviewing for the archives, because she did the, you know, my two best friends in the world are children of survivors, one of which Annette Insdorf has written about um, Holocaust films, and Eva Fogelman has written about rescuers and treats child of survivors. So I, I think I've continued my mother's tradition of being best friends with people who sort of share the, our experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm also very close to Mindy and Miriam Nathan. You know, Half my closest friends are children of survivors. Mm -hmm. We just understand. Commonality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And have done something with it. I mean, sort of the creative response. Mm -hmm. I know you know that from Mindy's mm -hmm. interview. Um, so it took me years to do Hank. So I'm sitting in there and I'm thinking, you know, I go to all these festivals with my films. We should have one here. So I started the Jewish Film Festival here. And luckily Arna saw the vision with Miriam. Arna. My, Meyer Michelson, uh -huh. who's another one uh -huh. I think you should interview before she leaves. And... It was the thought that, you know, Jewish films are an important vehicle for discussion, for viewing. And, the, the, uh, and I wanted to ask you if you think that this is part of a Jewish tradition, you know, the, the storytelling part, the stories in the mm. Bible or the Talmud or the, the, the authors who have added so much to the, what they call the Jewish bookshelf. If you think film is, plays a, a part of that as yeah. well. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's also very much an immigrant experience. By the way, there's a new film on Shomal I think that is so wonderful. Hopefully we'll be getting it soon. So anyhow, I started the Jewish Film Festival at that time, still doing Hank, thinking I need to get Hank done, so I quit the festival. Huh. And it took me ten more years, or like eight more years to do the film. Why did it take so long? It's just the money. Raising oh. the money mm -hmm. is, you know, I'm having this... You know. so the life of a documentary filmmaker is financially precarious, is it it's, not? It's absolutely. So how, how do you mind. deal with with that uncertainty? Is it just because well, of when I life? was making Hank, I used to sit down here and pray to this this uh, artwork here and say to my father, "I'm doing this to honor you. I'm doing this to honor you. I've got to tell this story." Sounds like your 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 mother praying to. Oh, uh, absolutely. Parents. Whatever you know, yeah, you just got to convince people. And and there's so many years I didn't even pay myself. It's it's just crazy, mm -hmm. you know. Do, do you think uh, is there anything Jewish about baseball? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a more intellectual game. The way you keep the statistics, and it's a quieter game. So yeah, I th I I mean I, I think football. I just roll my eyes at football. It's so brutal. And it's also so the the quintessential American sport. As American as, as right. baseball, and it's one way immigrants learn to be mm -hmm. to be American, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jews and non-Jews mm -hmm. themselves. And your dad may, maybe had that experience with baseball Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, you know. I is so it, that's why I say Hank Weaver was my dad's story. Mm -hmm. And was that where your love of baseball came from? Your father? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. He used to take my brother and I to games. Um, so then I was wondering about what to do next. Hank came out; it was an incredible success, more overwhelming than I ever believed, and won many awards. You, you name it, it won it, except for the Oscar nomination or award. How, how, how does it feel to be award, to re receive the recognition for your work? Uh, well, um, I'm happy because it may, well, first of all, it had a great commercial re uh, release. 
I'm happy because it, it gets my un, underknown heroes their, their time in the sun. Mm -hmm. So that's it. And all those years of hard work, it would be really awful if, you know. You feel maternal about your, your characters and yeah, your each films? Yeah, each one of them are my kids. Uh -huh. So then I'm trying to figure out what to do next. And there's an American Film Institute program for women directing, which I apply to. And you had to come with a script. And in 2000, when I was putting Hank out, I was trying to do everything I could to help make sure Gore won. It was, you know, going around town. And, and I knew Lieberman. So I decided to write a, uh, a little script called Today I Vote for My Joey, uh, which is a tragic comedy of how the Jews mistakenly voted on the butterfly ballot. In Florida. Florida. Mm -hmm. So that's my 20 minute film. Mm -hmm. Um, and my one foray into feature filmmaking. Well, uh, there's a script that comes up later, but in any event, um, it's a fun, tragic film, but you know, because it's a short, I mean, it's now in the uh, Molly DVD, it just hasn't gone anywhere, but it's, it's my way, at least the catharsis of getting that one out. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Lieberman was a real hero mm -hmm. to the Jewish community. Well, perhaps not so underknown. Yes, <laughs> correct, but um, it, it doesn't, fit that as much as the Jewish hero thing. And then I was looking to see what to do next, and about seven years ago, or eight years ago, I went to a show called Jews Entertaining America at the uh, Jewish Museum in New York, and in it they had recreated the Goldbergs' living room, and I just knew at that point I had to do a film on Gertrude Berg, because she had written, produced, starred in the first sitcom. She had a media empire. She was like Oprah. And she also did a kind of mother that wasn't the horrible stereotype, nagging mother, Jewish mother, but one that was in control and caring. And so again, it was the underknown Jewish hero or heroine in this case, as I called it, the most uh, famous woman in America you've never heard of. She's the Oprah of her time. Exactly. Uh -huh. And to sort of break the stereotype of when a woman wrote, writes her own role. And the great irony and tragedy is that her own mother was mentally ill, and yet she developed this whole persona. So again, fundraising again, um, and was able, you know, the film a year and a half ago was another great critical success, and maybe not as many awards, but almost still in the 90s in terms of Rotten Tomatoes, um, and also a great commercial success. Mm -hmm. Uh, you really don't make the money because you spend so much, but both docs have made over a million, which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. There's only one other woman that has two films that have made over a million, so um, I'm proud of that. Although trying to collect the money from people, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible business. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, then I um, was looking uh, what else to do? I mean, I'm, you know, I still want to continue these underknown Jewish heroes. So now this great story that both well, someone came to me and wanted me to do, but then he died, and then I heard Julian Rose, Julian Bond talk about him, and that's Julius Rosenwald. Mm -hmm. And the no one schools, knows about him. You want to hear obscure? It's yeah. just amazing. So um, I've been doing it off and on for three or four years, and again. Money is the uh -huh. big issue. Uh -huh. What is his story? Just um, He was the head of Sears. He was given a book by Paul Sachs of Sachs, uh, Sachs Goldman to read about uh, by Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery. And this is a guy influenced by his rabbi in Chicago. It's like the personification of Tikkun Olam. Gave away $62 million, a lot of the gear to African Americans, both in Wise, in housing, 5,500 schools in the South, they wouldn't have had schooling otherwise. For African-American communities. Right, and the Rosenwald Fund grants to all the great thinker, black thinkers. I mean, he defined black intellectualism then, or he supported it, sort of black McCarthy. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm working on now. I'm very excited about it, because black-Jewish relations, to me, has been a very important issue. The only thing is, again, this is getting a little tiring, raising the money. I also would love to make a film on Samuel Gompers, mm -hmm. the great labor union leader. Mm -hmm. 
totally forgotten. People also don't know that he was Jewish, and also the labor movement is getting maligned a lot now. Mm -hmm. so, so, do, do you can consider yourself, or have you ever thought about whether you are a, a Jewish documentary filmmaker, a woman documentary filmmaker, a feminist, or any of the above? Well, I consider myself a Jewish documentary filmmaker. Um, my feminism is more in being involved in women and film in town. Sometimes I blog for women in Hollywood, you know, just about the dearth of women, especially in the feature field. You know, we do, we were much more successful in the documentary world. Half the docs that come out are made by, women. by women. It's not true in the feature world. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, to have 10 films, two of which were made by women, in the Oscar category, but no female directors, you know. I, I'm afraid that um, the woman who made Hurt Locker, it may be another hundred years before we win. Just the way the system is structured? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Well, it's 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 a, an old boys club of keep on perpetuating, you know, higher. It, it's just a 5%. We just, mm -hmm. it's a total glass ceiling. What's Washington, D.C. like for a filmmaker? A As lot of, well, first of all, of well, I, I don't live there, uh -huh. although I live there making my little, um, today I vote for my Joey. Um, uh, the strongest film community is women in film. We're strength by numbers. It's a great networking organization. Uh, there's a lot of documentary filmmakers my age that I'm very close to, a great support system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's PBS here, there's... Discovery here, there's National Archive, you know, a lot of the research can be done here. Now, I asked you earlier if you considered yourself a role model for oh, yeah. the next generation. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, people come up to me. I try to have interns a lot mm -hmm. so that they come and they can go through the system. And Which, are you, do you encourage young women who want to be filmmakers? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Even though except, for the produce, except for the producing part. I mean, you just have to have a thick skin. Yeah. Um, your your house is is full of uh, it's very eclectic. Um, it looks like a lot of folk folk mm -hmm. art. Some works that your mother has has done. Yeah. Um, is it, is well, it, I always grew up in a surrounded by beauty. Way before my mother became an artist, an abstract expressionist artist with a one woman show at the Detroit Institute of Arts and shows in New York, she always had a lot of lively artistic mm -hmm. things. I think. My palette, the colors I'm attracted to, are very much Europe. It's probably what I grew up with, uh -huh. you know, living in Germany, mm -hmm. growing up in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and people say, oh, your house is like a museum. I said, no, this is how people live. Oh, you know? And a lot of it is, is uh, what we would call folk art. Folk art, but I also have a whole Judaica uh -huh. collection uh -huh. and photography collection. It's uh -huh. just things that... So, I love being surrounded by beauty. It's eclectic. It's eclectic. Like you. <laughs> And I also, um, you know, I say my brother has stocks and I have artwork. That's my stocks. Mm -hmm. So I probably will never sell it. Mm -hmm. But when I wake up in the morning, I love looking at my prints, my mother's paintings, when I come down the steps, you know, this is what I want to look at. Mm -hmm. um, Aviva, what, what, what um, is the, you know, you look so intimately at other people's lives. Mm -hmm. What have you learned by examining their lives? Oh, uh, hmm, that's a good question. Um, talent has, well, talent has a lot to do with it. Um, for partisans, it was just, I think these p young youth were already politically organized, already a step away from being so closely bound with their family and just had this vision. And I think people, all, you know, all my characters have vision. For the partisans, it was that the Nazis intended to kill everyone. And they actually read that, you know, from an Armenian example in 40 Days of Masadak or what had happened to the Armenians. And they said, we got to do something. We have to organize something. For Hank Greenberg, it was this raw talent, but this drive to keep on going and not let anything bother him. Uh, for uh, Gertrude Berg, it was, you know, this vision about a family sitcom, a story about her family or, or how she perceived her ideal family would be, would work, you know, and it did because it was a time of immigrants. 
um, Julius Rosenwald felt this responsibility of helping others because he had done so well. That you don't just make money, but you give it away. $62 million in your home lifetime. Um, I also have co-written a script about this Native American activist, Larry Casus, who at the height of uh, Wounded Knee took act, had tried so much to change political conditions in New Mexico in the town he was from, Gallup, that he went and kidnapped the mayor of Gallup. And someone I knew, and I had no idea he was doing it, I had been helping him with his political work, and sort of this profile of someone gone astray, but yet it was to help his people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for each one of them, um, they were at the right time, at the right place, to make a difference, but always this envision of, you know, um, a symbol of, you know, I guess Jews, you know, to, to, as Vicka said it, to, to choose how to die, not let the Nazis kill you, but to fight, mm -hmm. to at least be free Jews. For Hank, it was, you know, I have as much right as anyone to use my brawn to do well, I have to honor my religion. Yes, I know I'm a hero, but you know, I, I'm also a damn good baseball player. And for Gertrude Berg, it was this vision of what was entertainment, which has lived on and no one gave her credit for the, you know, the first Emmy, the first sitcom, you know, to keep on going. For Julius Rosenwald is, I can do very well in business, but I need to help others. This is what my rabbi has taught me. This is what I should do. And I think these are all the lessons you know, these are people I'd like to know. Yeah, sounds like your your stories inspire others and also yeah. inspire you. Right. Yeah. No, I I have to have someone that I think that's true. In, you know, inspiring stories are true to form. Although I do have some dramatic scripts that go a little other way, but still inspiring. Mm -hmm. Anything you would like to add? Um. You know, in terms of, even though I haven't been, quote unquote, um, spent a lot of time in the feminist movement, I consider my feminism very important in terms of being just a groundbreaker in the work I'm doing. And that any time I see that I think there's sexism, especially in filmmaking, you know, I do try to point it out, but I'm very grateful to the Women's Archives for putting together. I was touched when they contact me about my mother's archive, you know, to put stuff about her. And also, um, I think uh, what's important, just on a broader basis, is that uh, unless we seize the past, we can't go, you know, future, that each one of my quote-unquote heroes or heroines give us le lessons for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know what that was all about.